record. So we can begin. Make sure that you um, scroll over uh, my camera and then you find the little three dots and you pin. That way my screen will be the big one and not whoever's talking in case anyone comes off of me to, to say something, okay? Is everybody ready? Yeah, great, great, great. Okay, cool. So we left off the last time with factor and trinomials and we kind of just got to one example, um, but we weren't able to like really practice it. So we're gonna start today with really trying to practice those um, next few problems, okay? And so I did also identify that they were sort of like some of the problems that are inside your um, homework platform. So for the first one, I'm gonna go through that whole process again of how we find those magic numbers. So the goal is to split this number into these two magic numbers, but there's like a whole process on how we find those two magic numbers, right? So the first step is to actually take your A times your C. So in this case, it's six times negative five, which is negative 30. Now I'm not gonna worry about the sign when I do the square root. One, we can't take the square root of a negative 30. <laughs> so that's one reason. And two, I'm only concerned with the numbers, not necessarily the sign at this point. So in my calculator, I'm gonna go ahead and type in um, square root of 30. And of course it doesn't simplify, so it didn't do anything for me, but I'm gonna hit my double arrow so it can give me that decimal. There we go. So it's five point something or another, but I don't care about the decimal part, just the five. That tells me to go down this list all the way to five, and I will have all of my um, factors there. So you start doing the process. If you could do it in your head, great. If you cannot, you can always use the calculator, right? But we're essentially going to do 30 divided by one and then figure out what that should be 30 divided by two. Now for 30, this might make, you know, be silly because you could probably do those in your head. Um, but some of the numbers do get a little bit big, so it's handy just to know how the other this column is coming about. OK, however, when I tried to divide by four, I got a decimal, right? And since I got a decimal, that means that four does not have a pair that will go with it, okay? So if you do get those decimals, it just means that that, that kind of that row is out of the question. You're not gonna have a factor of four. And then finally, if I do 30 divided by five, I do get a nice pair of just six. Now it is a negative 30. So these numbers do have to multiply to give me a negative 30, but, when I add them, I'm supposed to be getting just B. And B is actually this number, negative seven, okay? So in order for me to multiply to get a negative, one of these columns has to be negative. But because when I add them together or combine them together, I will also get a, a negative, that tells me that the bigger numbers need to be negative. Right. Whenever you add numbers together, you always keep the larger sign. So that tells me that all of these guys, I'm going to color code here, all of these guys are going to be the negatives. Okay. Where and then it's get, just, uh, I apologize. Uh, where do you get the 24 from? Or is that from the last problem? Yeah, that was from this one. So when we did four times six, we had positive 24. And then we were trying to get the middle guy there, negative 11. So all of that is from the previous kind of chop okay. it off right there. Does that make sense? And 30, yeah, so it would be multiplied to um, uh, A times C, right? Mm -hmm. This guy's okay. A, so six, and then this guy is C, negative five. So when we multiplied the uh, six times the negative five, we got this negative 30. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And then the B was just right here in the middle. That's the negative seven B. And so the magic numbers we're trying to find are basically, you know, what number, when you multiply it by another number, it'll give you negative 30. But when you combine those same two numbers, they actually come out to equal negative seven. 
And so we talked about in the last class that the list of items that add to give you negative seven is infinite. There are an infinite number of combinations to add two numbers together to get negative seven. Whereas when you're multiplying, that's a finite list. That's a short, short list of things that will multiply to give you a number. So that's why we chose to try to find our magic numbers by breaking up the, the factors of 30. And so this little quick thing that I do on the side is just to, a way so that I know I have all the factors, right? If I don't do this, then I won't know when to stop on my list, okay? And the square root, like what is that? Is that um... That's just to give me the max that I will write this column. Okay. So notice here when I did the square root of 24, I got four. So I knew I needed this column to be one, two, three, four. Here I got a square root of five. So I wrote down my column one, two, three, four, five. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then once I had all these little numbers, we just did a division game, right? 30 divided by this guy gave me this result. 30 divided by two gave me that result. 30 and so on and so forth, right? The only one that didn't work was four because when I tried four, I got a decimal. Oops, didn't see the camera. So when I tried four, it gave me a decimal, which is why that one did not have a pair, okay? Okay, so now what I need to do is I figured out that one of them had to be a negative in order for this product to give me a negative, right? A positive times a negative will give me a negative. But I need to figure out which of these combinations of numbers actually adds to give me negative seven. And it looks like this one's the one, right? Three plus a negative 10. If I were to type that in here, three plus negative 10, it does give me negative seven. So then that's going to be the pair that I use is this three and the negative 10. Now you don't have to write this part. This is just for your own visualization, right? Normally I don't ever write this. I just do my math and then I make sure that I get that middle number over there, okay? But this is what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so this works, right? This product gives me negative 30 and this sum gives me negative seven. So now I know how to split this negative seven, but the negative seven has a P attached, which means when I split it, I'm gonna have a positive three and it needs to have a P. And I have a negative 10 and it needs to have a P. And if I were to combine those, it is equivalent to that negative seven P, right? So we're just conveniently rewriting negative seven P differently. And the reason it's convenient is because now I have four terms and anytime you have four terms, you always default to the factor by grouping. So, and I'm gonna factor this one by grouping. Let's see if we remember. I know you kind of have a hint up above, but if you're looking at this one um, and I group them, where am I chopping this thing in half? Anyone want to guess? In front of the negative 10 P? Yep, you got it right. And in front of that negative 10, right after that second term, right? Good. And so then we'll factor what this left side of the problem has in common. So what would be the common factor they have in common? And think of the letters and the numbers separate, right? So what number can both of these be divided by? And then how many letters could you take out? 3P. Yep, yeah, 
three and a P. Good. And so then if you have to do the side work where you divide each one by three P, that's totally okay. But what is six P squared divided by three P? Two P. Yep, we get two and a P. Now I'm gonna bring down my plus sign. And what is three P divided by three P? One. Right, it's Just one. It does not cancel. Remember we talked about that the last time? When you're factoring something out, however many terms are here, you have to have those same number of terms on the inside. So if you were to cancel, then you wouldn't have this one and then you wouldn't be following that rule, right? With the same number of terms. And we know that anything divided by itself would just be one, even a weird thing like 3P. Now, does anybody remember the next trick before I can start figuring out what these two guys have in common? What do I have to do before I get to see what they have in common? Uh, bring down the sign. Right. So this guy right there has to come down. And then regardless of signs, don't pay attention to signs, just the numbers and the letters. What do these two things have in common? I think I heard somebody say it. Five. Yes, they both can be divided by five, but this one doesn't have a P, right? So we couldn't take that P out. So now I know what goes outside the parentheses. I'm going to divide both of these numbers by that negative five sitting outside the parentheses. So then a negative divided by a negative will actually give me two and a P positive. And a negative divided by a negative will give me a one, but it's positive. And then now if you look at the whole line, what does this half and this half have in common? 2p plus one. Mm -hmm. And essentially they basically come out as one, right? And then you're just writing what's left over. So if this is out here, all you have left over is the 3p. And if this is also out there, then all you have left over is the minus five. And then this is the actual answer. Now, again, just to recap, we can check, right? If you wanna check your answers, you just multiply it out. I won't check every single one. I just wanted to get you guys to remember that you can check when you're factoring. So we'll do 2P times the whole second parentheses and then plus one times the whole second parentheses. And then I'll distribute. So I'll get 6P squared minus 10P. And then I'll distribute the positive one, which means I'll get 3P minus five. And if I combine these two like terms, we get the 6P squared minus 7P minus five, which does match what we were trying to factor, right? So this one does check out. I just wanted to make you guys aware of that because I get a lot of times the students are, especially on the test, right? They wanna know if they got it right or not. <laughs> you will know if you got a factoring problem right or not, okay? As long as you're multiplying it correctly. Okay, go ahead. I have, I have, I have one more question, sorry. Sure. From the, I don't know if you can see my face. Well, actually. So I guess the final answer, and then the step before that, I guess I have some confusion. Like, mm -hmm. um, right here? I don't, uh, yeah, like, like, like how I got from that to the final answer. Right here? Um, yeah. yeah. It's like, 
if you imagine this as 3p and a q minus 5q, you're factoring what they have in common and they both have this q, right? So you would take that q and factor it out. And when you factor it out, all you have left is 3p minus 5. It's the same thing even if they have all of this in common. So that whole thing comes out to the front of the parentheses. And then if it factored out, all you're left with is the 3p and the minus 5. So it's very similar to this, the regular GCF. The only thing different is that it's a complicated GCF. Okay, But if that's in parentheses, make sure when you take it out that you put it in parentheses. And these should match. I'm going to erase this just because that was not part of the problem. <laughs> That's just my explanation, but I'm going to erase this part just real quick. Does that help at all? Okay, good. Okay. So let me draw my line again just because it helps kind of keep things separate. And we can move on to the next one. So here, I know my focus is a little wacky and that's another thing when they put me in here, I thought that this computer had the software that I needed for my camera, but it doesn't. So I'm just going pure off of the camera um, input. I'm not using the actual application that's supposed to go with it. <laughs> Otherwise I could fix my, uh, my, I guess, focus on this problem. So I promise, I promise, I promise, I'm going to get everything situated. <laughs> so the next time I see you guys on Thursday, it'll be all straight. Much better than the way it is right now. Okay, so we're going to do the same process again. We have to figure what times what is going to give me AC. So in this case, it's 2 times negative 18. And if you have to use a calculator, don't be ashamed. 2 times negative 18. The only thing I will point out is that there's a difference between the minus sign and the negative sign, okay? So make sure you're using the correct one when you're trying to use this. I'm just doing a two times a negative eight. So I'm gonna, eight, negative 18, I'm sorry. And I got negative 36. But then I have to find the same numbers that will actually give me this middle guy, which is positive 13. Now, you may or may not already know what they are, but I'm going to go through the process. So it's negative 36, the product that I have to split up. Don't ever try to split up the bottom one. Always try to split up the AC. So if I take the square root of 36 in my calculator, it's actually a nice one. It's just six. So there's no decimal I have to ignore. I just got a flat six which tells me I have to go down this list all the way to six. And then I start doing all of the division, right? So 36 divided by one is 36. 36 divided by two is 18. 36 divided by three is 12. 36 divided by four is nine. 36 divided by five is actually a decimal. So then that means that five is not gonna be on my list anymore. And then 36 divided by six is six. Now I know those multiplications in my head, so I just did them without using the calculator, right? But if you have to use a calculator, by all means, go for it. It just takes a little tiny bit more time, but I mean, hey, if you're gonna get the problem right, it's worth it, right? So now we have to go through all of these and find the pair that actually well, uh-oh, we have some thinking to do with these signs. In order for me to get a negative after I multiply, one of these numbers has to be negative. Now, I'm not going to say it. I want somebody else to say it. Is it going to be the small column that gets the negatives or the large column that gets the negatives? And why? The, the small column. 
Mm -hmm. Why is it the small column gets the negatives? Because uh, positive, it's a positive number that we're right. aiming for. You're right. When I add them, I'm supposed to end up with a positive, right? Which means we know when we add sign numbers, you always end up with the sign of the bigger guy. So then I know that the bigger guy is actually going to be a positive. And all these numbers are the bigger guys, right? Well, with the exception of this one, they're the same. But for the most part, the right column will be the bigger one. So you're right. Those guys have to be positive, which means the little guys need to be negative. And then which of these actually gives me 13? I don't think any of these do, right? If I do negative one, positive 36, I get positive 35. If I do negative two plus 18, I get 16. If I do negative three plus 12, I get nine. If I do negative four plus nine, I get five. And then negative six plus six is zero. Did any of those give me 13? None of them, right? In this case, so I'm going to write a note here. When you cannot get, and again, I call them magic numbers. So when you cannot find those magic numbers and you have done absolutely everything you're supposed to have done through the process, which was to take the square root of that number so that you knew how far to go in the list, this is all the factors of 36, but it just so happens that none of them give you that B value, the guy in the middle. None of them give you positive 13. When that happens, then that means that this trinomial cannot be factored. And so what do you enter in the box whenever something cannot be factored? Does anybody remember? I'll give you a hint. It starts with the letter P. It's prime. Yeah, that's it, prime. So when it cannot be factored, you just say that this trinomial is prime, okay? And I have done everything correctly. So. The fact that I did it all right, but nothing worked, that's what tells me that it's prime. If you don't do this and write your list all the way down to that number, you don't know if you got them all or not, okay? That's why I find it very handy to be doing that square root business on the side, just so I know I have them all and still they didn't work. Now this one does not look fun. <laughs> But it says to factor this trinomial. Now, we have been, I have not been mentioning something, and mostly because it didn't apply to anything that we were doing so far. However, here now it applies. When you are factoring trinomials, the very first thing you should be doing is always trying to factor out a GCF or a greatest common factor. Then, after you factored out the greatest common factor, then you can factor the resulting um, trinomial. However, in this case, these guys didn't have anything in common. So there was no GCF to factor out at the beginning, which is why I never mentioned it, okay? Same th with this one. These didn't have anything in common. So again, no GCF, so I never mentioned it. And the same thing here. These two guys had something in common. These two guys have something in common, but nothing is in common with all three, right? And so I didn't take out a GCF at the beginning. However, when we're looking at this last example, these all do have something in common. And in case this is really blurry, it is a cube, a three power, okay? So it's 16y 
with a three power plus 25y with a two power minus 16y with no power. Well, there's an invisible one there, but nothing visible. So what do all three of these guys have in common? Remember to pick the greatest that they have in common. Four. They do all have four in common. Oh, However, eight. that's not the greatest. It's eight, sorry. It is eight, yes, yes, good. So they all can be divided by eight and do they all have variables? Eight Y. Mm-hmm. They all have at least just one guy, right? One Y. So you're right. We could take out an 8Y. When I do that, 16 divided by 8 is going to give me 2. And Y cubed, take away a Y, is going to give me Y squared. 24 divided by 8 is 3. I had Y squared, but I took out a Y, which means I only have one more. Negative 16 divided by 8 is negative 2. And the y came out, so I don't have another y for that term. Now, when you're factoring the rest of this, because I do want to try to still factor this in here, OK? The goal is to get down so that you have the two bubbles like this. But don't forget about your GCF because that is part of your answer. What I want to know is what goes in these two bubbles, right? <clears throat> so we're going to apply that AC method again, but just looking at what's in the parentheses. So I'm going to do what time? Actually, I don't want to do it underneath there, because that's normally where I split, right? So what times what, and then what plus what? Remember to do A times C. So what do I get when I do A times C? Negative six. Oh wait, I wrote it wrong. It would be negative, negative something. Mm -hmm. Say it again, I'm sorry. Negative four. Yeah, there you go. Negative four. And then the next one is just the middle guy and that's positive three. So positive three. Well, this is nice because when I break up that product, I only have to do the square root of four, which is actually two, which means I'm gonna have a really short list, aren't I? So four divided by one is four. 4 divided by 2 is 2. And again, I have a negative. So these do have to multiply to give me a negative, which means one of the columns will be negative. But because my result is a positive 3 after adding, that means that my bigger column is going to be positive. So if this column is going to be positive, then that means this column has to be the negatives. This, if I add those two together, that's going to give me zero. But if I add these two together, I do get that positive three. So now I know my magic numbers. It's going to be negative one y plus four y. And bring down the last guy and bring down the first guy. And always make sure, like if you were to combine these back together, would they give you this? And if they do, then you're good. This line is completely equivalent to that line. So we'll chop it up because we have four people now. This side looks like they have a Y in common. So that's going to give me a two and a Y left. And if the Y is gone, it's just going to give me a minus one. I do have to bring down that plus sign. And then what do these two guys have in common? Mm -hmm. So then we'll factor that out. A positive divided by a positive will give me positive two with the Y. 
And then positive, or I'm sorry, negative divided by a positive actually gives me a negative. But what's two divided by two? Mm -hmm, I see people with their finger. <laughs> yes, just one. <laughs> Good. And so then you see the two bubbles, right? Or two sets of parentheses. The left side of the line and the right side of the line both have this 2y minus 1 in parentheses. So since both sides of the line have it, we will factor it out. But if it's factored out, all we have left is a y from in front of the line. And if we factor that out, all we have is a plus 2 from behind the line. And I guess I'm not moving enough. My lights just turned off. <laughs> There it goes. That kind of scared me <laughs> for a second. Okay. Um, so there we go. We found our two little bubbles. And so we have to remember, though, this is not the final answer, right? Because we did take out a GCF at the very, very beginning. And we were just trying to figure out what was going to go in these little bubbles. And so we have to remember about that GCF. But this is the final answer. Okay. Now, one thing that I have not mentioned, and I do want to mention, is sometimes people don't always put these numbers in the same exact order like I have been doing. So you notice how negative one is on the left and then positive four is on the right. And when I split this guy, I always put the negative one on the left and then the positive four on the right. But what I wanted to show you guys is that if you happen to not put them in the same order as me, but you still found the same two magic numbers, right? Let's say you put the positive four in the front and then the negative y in the back. You would go about all the grouping exactly the same way, right? Except this time they would have two y in common, leaving you with the y plus two. Here, you would have to bring down your minus. And they have nothing in common, so you would have to factor out a 1. But it's actually a negative 1. So when you divide, it's going to change these into positives. And then they have this y plus 2 in common. So when you factor those out, you end up with the 2y minus 1. It's exactly the same thing as what we got here. Just notice that you have one bubble in front of the other swapped right? But it's the same answer. So the computer will know to mark this correct or this correct, okay? As long as what's in those bubbles is exactly the same, it will accept both answers. It's like the same thing as saying like two times three is six or three times two is six. You, they're still equivalent, aren't they? They're just written in a different order, okay? Because I did, I think I had somebody text me a question like that. Like, you got this, but I got with them the other direction. And that's okay. It's the same answer. Okay. We are going to move on to the next page. However, in this next page, there's some formulas that they give you. But I don't give those formulas. I don't even think there's a point. I don't understand the point of memorizing these formulas when you could just do what you've been doing and get the same correct answer, okay? So I don't memorize those. I don't ever use those formulas, ever. Never have I ever <laughs> um, used those formulas. I just factor it the same way I've been factoring all the other problems and it comes out, okay? So I'm actually going to do this one first. I put a little arrow to remind myself not to do that one first because it's ugly. Um, so we're going to do this nice one that's more like what you'll see in the future. So I noticed that this one had P's and Q's and that one had X's and Y's. But in the future, we're really going to see them like this with just X's. So if I take this one and I do this AC method that we've been doing, right? We do 9 times positive 1, and that gives me just positive 9. Then I do the middle guy, and that's a positive 6. So remember, always take the factors of the product guy. 
So square root of nine actually is a nice number three. So when I go to break up this positive nine, it's only going to go down to three. And then we start our division situation, right? Nine divided by one is nine. Nine divided by two is 4.5, a decimal. So this guy's no good. Then nine divided by three is three. And of these two pairs, this is the, the two numbers that are actually gonna add to give me six, isn't it? Okay. And I didn't need to mess around with signs. Since this is positive, they both have to be positive or they both have to be negative. But because my result had to be positive, that was my clue that they would both be positive. Now that we know what the two magic numbers are, they're two positive threes, we split. So positive three with an X attached, positive three with an X attached, bring down the front guy and bring down the back guy. And now you have your four, your four terms. So when I cut that in half, this side actually has a three and an X in common. So when I divide by three X, I get three and an extra X plus, and then three X divided by three X again, is just gonna give me one. Let me bring down my plus sign. And these two guys have nothing in common. So all I can take out is a one. And if I divide both of these by positive one, they stay exactly the same, positive three and positive one. But now the two sides of the line have three X plus one inside parentheses. So if I take out that three X plus one in parentheses from here and from here, what I'm left over with is three X plus one again. And if you remember the definition of an exponent, the definition of an exponent is repeated multiplication. So the fact that I have this times itself means I can write it as three X plus one with the square because they're exactly the same. And so I solved it using the knowledge from the previous concept, right? I didn't have to memorize a formula to be able to factor that. So me personally, I don't use the formulas. The only thing I do is I factor it like the way I normally would with the AC method. And if they happen to match, I'll write them once with the square. Now we'll go to example A, but does this one have anything in common? So there's a lot going on. Do all the terms have a P? No. Do all the terms have a Q? No. No. Can all the terms be divided by five? Not that guy, right? And I was thinking maybe they could be divided by four, but this one cannot be divided by four. So they really have nothing in common. I thought maybe they would, but they don't. So unfortunately, when I set up the AC method, this is going to be dramatic. We have to do A times C, which is not nice. I think it's a huge number, like 400. Yeah, 400. And then the middle guy is actually a negative 40. So this 400 number, oh my gosh, there are so many numbers that multiply to give you 100 that you wouldn't even think about, okay? So this little square root business is really gonna help us to make sure that we have all the combinations, okay? So if I type square root of 400 in my calculator, it does tell me it's a nice 20, no decimal. This is a nightmare, but if you see the magic numbers as you're going, then stop.
So I don't even have any room here. Um, I'll go over here to the side, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then you're gonna start dividing each of these by four, right? So by 400 divided by one is 400. 400 divided by two is 200. 400 divided by three is a decimal. 400 divided by four is 100. 400 divided by five, is 80, 400 divided by six is a decimal, 400 divided by seven is a decimal, 400 divided by eight is 50, 400 divided by nine is a decimal, 400 divided by 10 is 40, divided by 11 is a decimal, divided by 12 is also a decimal, divided by 13 is a decimal, Let's see, that one's a decimal. This one's a decimal. That one is 25 decimal. Decimal, decimal, and this one is 20. Now, let's think of the signs. This was a positive times a positive, which made a positive, okay? In order for it to be a positive, the two columns either have to have both positive or they have to both be negative so that when I multiply them, I get a positive. But after I add, my result should be negative, which tells me that both columns have to be negative. Now, does anybody see the magic numbers that will combine to give us negative? 40. Um, negative 20, 20. Yep, 20. you got it. These guys, right? The very last ones on the list. Sometimes it happens that way. <laughs> so then that is how I'm going to split that middle guy. So we'll go here, write down the first term. And then instead of this term, we're going to use negative 20s. So negative 20 with the same variables attached and another negative 20 with the same variables attached. And they have to have the same because they, in order for you to combine them, they have to be like terms, right? Which means they have to have the same letters and they have to match that so that when you combine them, you still have P's and Q's. Now from here, it's four, so we'll chop it and always bring this guy down. What does these two have in common? The greatest common factor. Uh, four. Mm -hmm. What about the letters? P. Uh -huh. They both have a P. So I'm going to take out 4P. So if I divide this by 4P, I'm going to get 4 with an extra P. And if I divide this by 4P, I'm going to get minus 5 with that Q still there. Let's bring down the minus. And then what do these two guys have in common? 5Q. You got it. 5Q. But there's a negative on the outside now, right? So we're going to divide both of these by negative 5Q. So a negative divided by a negative will actually give me positive 4. Qs are gone, but I still have that P. Positive 25 divided by negative 5 is negative 5. And one of the Qs is gone, but I still have another one. And the two parentheses match, right? So we're going to take what's in that parentheses out. And when I factor these two things out, 
all I'm going to be left with is 4p minus 5q inside the other set of parentheses. So this one went here and this one went here. This was just what they had in common. And then they are exactly the same. So the very last thing that you may want to do is just write it with the square because they are exactly the same thing. Okay, so we've talked about how to factor out a GCF. We've talked about how to factor um, polynomials when they have four terms, that's the grouping, right? And then we talked about how to factor trinomials. And essentially all we're doing is turning them into four terms and then factoring it by grouping, right? Um, but now what we're gonna do is, that was like a whole process and there were levels to those processes, right? And in those levels, we got to see different kinds of polynomials. Um, but now what we're gonna concentrate on is binomials, okay? So when we talk about binomials, there's really three of them. There is, that can be factored in any way. There's what's called the difference of squares. So when you have a subtraction, but two perfectly squared people on the sides, there's a difference of cubes where you have a subtraction and then two perfectly cubed people on the side. And then the sum of cubes where there's a plus sign in the middle and then two perfectly cubed guys. However, in this class, we, don't, we aren't going to see the difference of cubes or the sum of cubes, okay? It's less for us to worry about. But the one situation we will see probably a lot is the difference of squares, okay? So when you notice that your first term is perfectly squared and your second term is perfectly squared, it will factor like this, okay? And if you wanted to check that, right, how does this result in that? Well, what you do is you take the first guy times the second parentheses and then the second guy times the second parentheses. And when I distribute this x, I get x squared plus xy. When I distribute this negative y, I get negative xy and negative y squared. And then what happens to those guys in the middle? If you have an xy and then you take away an xy, that means there's no more xy's, right? So you just end up with x squared minus y squared, okay? So it does play out like that. So if you're trying to get the difference of squares, these will be your factors. Basically, whatever the square root of that is goes in the front of each bubble. Whatever the square root of this guy is goes behind each bubble. And then in order for you to get a negative, one of them's gonna have to be plus and then one of them's gonna have to be negative, okay? And it doesn't matter if you put it in the other order. We talked about that the last time. In the, in the other example, they're both the same thing, okay? So where you decide to put the plus and where you decide to put the minus does not matter. You just put it wherever you want. Just make sure that one of them has a plus and one of them has a minus. Um, and then something worth mentioning in case anyone tries to uh, factor this, if I were to have something squared and something squared, but a plus sign in the middle, it's actually not factorable. So don't even try to factor it if it's got a plus. If it has a minus, it can factor. If it has a plus in between the squares, it cannot factor. And there's that fancy word we used the last time, right? Prime. Okay, so let's see what some of those problems are gonna look like. So I've got one here on the next page. 
Um, it says to factor each of these polynomials, and the first one is like number 10, it's 4m squared minus 9. So essentially what we do is we take the square root of this guy, and we take the square root of this guy. Now for here, you can use your calculator, right? What's the square root of 9? We know that that is 3. And I could even do the square root of four in my calculator to give me two. But what about the square root of m squared? I'm not going to change row one, but me. However, I'll be right. Essentially, what times what is going to give me that m squared? That'll be Isn't it just one? It's m to the power one. But we don't ever really write the one, do we? Right? And then check it. Is three times three equal to nine? Yeah. Is two m times two m equal to four m squared? It is. So then these are good. Now, if I want to know how to factor it, I have to write 2m in the front because the 4m squared is in the front, and then the 3 in the back because the 9 is in the back. And then one of these has to have a plus sign in the middle, and one of them has to have a minus sign. And it does not matter which one. I'm just going to put plus first, then minus, because that's my choice. But if you put minus and then plus, you still have the same answer. I'll use the one stop in that I'll wrote I'll multiply row two by four three and add that to row one. Zero times two times four three to the point here. I can see that the value of x as the solution to this is three. And the value of y as the solution to this is three. Okay. Now let's keep going because there's another one that looks crazier. <laughs> there's always crazier ones. This crazy one. <laughs> so it's a little bit weird looking, but let's try. Let's see what we get. So we have to do the square root of two, five, six, K to the fourth, and then the square root of six, two, five, M to the fourth. Now the numbers I can do in the calculator. Okay, so square root of two, five, six, I could do that one. And square root of six, two, five, I can do that one. The letters are more difficult, okay? And I'm gonna share you, with you a um, exponent rule or radical rule, whatever you wanna call it. Radicals are exponents, by the way. So I'm just gonna say exponent rule. But if you have a number here in your index of your radical and you have an exponent inside the radical, all you're doing is taking the exponent on the inside and dividing it by the index on the outside. I wrote down two because what's the index in a square root? So if I just have the square root of something with an exponent, I take the exponent on the inside, and what am I dividing it by? What is the index right here on a square root? Anybody want to guess? Would it be two? Yeah, it is two. So then if I want to divide that, I have to divide by two. Now notice over here, if you take this exponent of two and divide it by the invisible two here, don't you get the invisible one? Right? 
But here, if I take this exponent of four and divide it by the indivis invisible two, I'm actually gonna get an exponent of two, right? Four divided by two is two. This one happens to be the same thing. So I will have M and then four divided by two is two. But I'm doing that because there is a rule that allows me to do it, okay? But now I know what the roots are so I can factor my problem. Um, this one's in the front. So the 16K squared will go in the front of each parentheses. And then this one was in the back. So the 25m squared will go in the back. And then again, just one with the plus and one with the minus. And just for argument's sake, I'm gonna go backwards and put the plus over here and the minus over there. Because like I said, it doesn't matter which one, you just have to have one with the plus and one with the minus. Now this one said factor each polynomial. It didn't say the words factor completely, okay? Because this is not factored completely. I just factored it. I did not factor it completely. And why do I not? The reason I know that this is not factored completely is because I personally know then I can take the square root of 16K squared and I can take the square root of 25M squared. Remember, you can't do it when there's a plus, only when there's a minus, right? The square root of 16 is four and two divided by two is gonna give me the invisible one. The square root of 25 is five and two divided by two is gonna give me the invisible one. So I could factor this guy even more. And it would factor into 4K minus 5M and 4K plus 5M. But this one could not be factored anymore because even though it has the same numbers, that rule on the previous page told us if there's a plus in between them, this is prime, okay? So you cannot factor that one anymore. This would be factored completely. And it's only coincidental that this could actually keep factoring. Here, right, we didn't have any squares. So those could not keep factoring. But it's just a coincidence that on this problem, it could keep factoring. And I noticed there was one like that in your, in your homework, but it looked a lot different than this one. This one looks a lot simpler than that one looks, but it actually will do the same kind of thing. It will like factor twice. So if I were to take the square root of X to the fourth and then the square root of one, again, four divided by the invisible two is a two and the square root of one is just one. So this would actually factor into x squared plus one and then x squared minus one, right? This one we know is prime, but this one can keep factoring because if I take the square root of each of those guys, the square root of this, well, two divided by two is one, and then the square root of one is just one. And so that second one, the second parentheses, will actually factor into x plus one and then x minus one. So this one also had that kind of cascading effect where um, it factored, but then it could continue to be factored some more. So I wanted to make sure you had two examples of that one, because I don't know if they're gonna give you a nice little one like that or a crazy one with these big numbers, but at least you'll have an example of both types when you get to your um, homework. Now, these so were some weird to, ones, go ahead. Sure, would you ahead. like us to Would you like us to factor it all the way or is either acceptable? 
normally it says it in the instruction. So normally the instructions say to factor completely. I just noticed that this one did not say factor completely. It just said factor. And so if that's all they're telling you to do, they should accept this answer. But if you see the phrase factor completely, then they will not accept this answer. It'll pop up and it'll tell you it can be factored more. Okay, and then that would be your cue, like, hey, I need to split that up and keep going. But it will give you a hint based on what you type in as an answer in the computer. Sometimes it can like pinpoint where your error is, and sometimes it gives you like a general check this, this, and that, right? But for this one, if you enter this, it will tell you your answer is correct, although it can be factored more. And then you would know to keep going. But thank you for asking. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm a um, loss of the factor completely. And so I understand the factor it all the way down. But this then, part? yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then also the answer. But why? then from here, we why? notice that oops, we still have a difference of two squares. And so then that was why we knew we needed to factor this part more. Because if it's a difference of two perfect squares, we're supposed to be factoring it using that rule. And since this factor is still a difference of two perfect squares, that's why we had to keep that same process and factor it into its own two factors. So it's yes. like that one came down and then okay. that one got factored into two separate. And it's only for the the negative or the minus? Right, it's only okay. for the difference of two squares. On the other page, it told us when you have, when you have the sum of two squares, that's prime. So you cannot factor that one. I know some of you are still scribbling stuff down, so I'm going to wait just a minute and then I'll keep going. So if you printed the papers, the next page is page 30. And actually that one is all about um, the factoring, the sums and cubes, the sums and differences of cubes. And I mentioned in the previous page that we will not be covering the cubes, only the difference of squares. So the only binomials that we'll see are going to be the either the difference of squares or the sum of squares that cannot go anywhere. They cannot be factored. Those are the only binomials we should see. Excuse me, I got the hiccups all of a sudden. <coughs> so this whole page, page 30, we're just going to go over it. We're just going to flip it over and scratch that one out because we're not going to use that page, okay? And on the next page, um, they talk about factoring by substitution. So I'm going to scoot this up just a little bit. See, it says factor by substitution. However, they gave us like these crazy problems. And for us in this class, we don't do all of those different variations. So I wanted to give you a problem, like one you actually would see. So the factoring by substitution method is one that's handy to learn and it will come up in this class, okay? So we do need to cover it. I just didn't feel the necessity to cover it with all these crazy problems when they're not like the ones that we'll see. And then I accidentally, prematurely scratched everything out. And then I realized, oh no, that's the one I want. <laughs> so I wrote it back over here. So it's the same one that was already there. Um, I just kind of scratched it off and realized, no, this is the one I want. This, we're not doing different, the cubes, right? And then this one is a substitution problem, but it's just too crazy. It's not like anything we're going to see, okay? So only example seven part C is the one that we're gonna see. But since I crossed out that whole previous page, I think we left off with example five, right? 
And so this one I'm calling example six, part A. So it's just one problem we're gonna cover when we talk about this substitution business. And actually, I kind of gave you an intro to substitution today when someone asked a question about how the grouping was working. So I'm gonna find that paper real quick. Remember this problem? And I guess I shouldn't have erased it, but remember I said it was like you had three P and imagine this whole thing is a Q and then you have five. And again, that whole thing is a Q. And then we said, well, when we factor this, we noticed they had the Q in common. And so we factored that Q out. And then basically you just had to remember that it wasn't actually Q, it was actually two P plus one. So out here should actually be a two P plus one in parentheses, right? That's kind of the way substitution works. So if something is like clouding your vision, um, and it's looking really, really complicated. A lot of times people will use substitution so that it's not so muddy, okay? And I'll give you an example here, although I'm not gonna do this problem. You see this thing repeating twice. Well, what you can do is you can tell whoever's reading your paper, say, let, I don't know, pick a letter. This is A, so I'll pick B. Let B equal all that mess in the parentheses. So then when you rewrite it, you don't have to write all the mess in the parentheses, you can just write B instead. And then this looks more like something you've been doing already, okay? That would just require me to do AC method, right? So here we're gonna do the exact same thing, but I'm gonna show you what should be happening because Notice in here, there are three terms. There's this big long thing because they're all multiplied together. This big long thing because that's multiplied together. And then you have this 15. Those are your three terms there. Notice that I let my extra letter that I came up with, I let that equal the thing that was in the middle term. Okay, and that's going to be your key idea. When you're doing substitution, you always wanna substitute for the weird part of the middle term. So in this case, you're gonna leave the coefficient alone. This is what you're going to substitute, okay? So I'm going to say let, and I want some other letter, I don't want Z. We could use X. There's no X in this problem. Um, so we'll let X equal this Z squared. Now, what happens if I square both sides of this equation? This is going to become X squared, and this is actually going to become Z to the fourth power. So now I have something to plug in instead of Z squared, I can plug in an X. And instead of Z to the fourth, I can plug in X squared. So this is where the substitution part comes in. So the problem becomes six, and instead of Z to the fourth, we're gonna use his replacement, X squared, minus 13, and instead of writing z squared, we're gonna use his replacement and just write x. And then now this looks more like what we have been doing when we've been doing our AC method. So we will do the whole bit, right? That's negative 30. Um, the square root of 30 is five point something. And so then my numbers would be 30, 15, 10, four doesn't work, and six. One of these has to be negative because I have a negative um, 30, right? So either the low column will be negatives or the big column will be negatives. But because my result in the middle needs to be a negative, that tells me the big column is going to be the negatives. And 
And which of these pairs actually gives us this negative 13? Is it this pair, the three and the negative 10? What is three plus negative 10? Three plus negative 10. Is that negative 13? No, right? What about two plus negative 15? That's the pair that gives us the negative 13. Okay. A lot of people's eyes automatically want to pick this one <laughs> just because you see the three and the 10, right? But it's actually this one that works. Okay. So be very careful. So then we do the same process as before. We'll split that 13x into positive 2x and negative 15x. We'll go about our grouping business the same. So this side had a two and an X in common, which will give me three, an X plus, ooh, a one. We'll bring down our minus sign. These can both be divided by five, but that means I'm dividing them by negative five. So it'll become positive three X and then positive one. So then they have this 3x plus one in common, which leaves me with 2x minus five in the other parentheses. Now I have factored it. So I'm done with the factoring part. The problem is, is that the computer will tell me this is the wrong answer. Did my original problem in ever have x's in it? It did not have any X's, it had Z's, didn't it? So my answer should have Z's. So this is essentially where you, what's called back substitute. So here was when I substituted. And then here's where you do what's called back substitute. So you put back what was originally supposed to be there, okay? So instead of X, X is actually the same thing as Z squared. So the answer is actually three Z squared plus one, and then two Z squared minus five. And this is the actual answer. And if you were to check that, again, I won't just for class time purposes, right? We already ran out of time. Um, I won't check this, but if you were to check it, it would come out to equal that. Okay, that is the end of this section. So I would really, really, really suggest that you practice this one. It's going to come up later. It might not come up yet in this homework assignment, but it will come up later. So I just kind of wanted you to see it so that when I bring it up again later, it's not completely foreign, okay? Although it may still be a tiny bit, but we'll still work it out exactly all the same way, okay? Um, but that is it. If I don't have any questions, you guys are free to go. When we come back the next time, we'll be heading on to the next section. So let me let me tell you what section number that is in case you're trying to um, download the the stuff from my notes. So we will actually cover one point four next. So if you're downloading from um, my notes, make sure that you download 1.4. So right here, you would go to chapter one and then just worry about the section 1.4. I'm a minute over now, sorry, but you guys have a good day. And if you come up with any questions later, please text me, okay? I'm here for you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.